Father, we thank you. Lord, we give you all of the praise. Thank you for your presence in the room this morning. Kaya Libra, understanding, but it will give us light that brings clarity, that brings speed, and brings prosperity in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I thought I'd hear a louder amen than that. Praise God. So this month, of course, Pastor K for the last two weeks has been talking about show me the money. Show me the money. And whether you like it or not, we need money. So this is definitely one series that you cannot afford to miss. You have to keep going back to the messages over and over and over and over again. And every time you hear the messages, you have to go out and put, put down the things that you know that you're going to do. Don't just write notes and put them under your pillow. You have to write down the things that you know you're going to do. So today we're going to take it a bit further. And we're talking, we're still talking about money. So today, um, before I get into the message proper, I want to uh, also introduce you to one of my books from the Wow Man series. For those of you who don't have the Wow Man series, this is what the Wow Man series actually looks like. One of the books in the series is on money. And I shared some of the personal secrets that have helped us um, to make money, manage money, multiply money, some of the money mindsets that we also had, um, and how important they are. The book is called Affluence. And this morning I'll be sharing a bit from it, as well as other things. But let's start from Third John chapter 1, verse 3. 3 John chapter 1, verse 3. Let's start from there this morning. This morning, I want to talk to you about the disciplined soul. One of the things I know, if you're going to make money, if you're going to manage money, if you're going to multiply money, if you're going to be able to settle your money, one of the things that you're going to first deal with is your soul. Your soul. So 3 John 1, 2. I'm sorry. 3 John 1, 2. It says, I'll read the Passion Translation. It says, Beloved friend, I pray that you are prospering in every way. I love that. You are prospering in every way. And that you continually enjoy good health just as your soul is prospering. It says that you are prospering in every way. Every way means every way. So whether it is prospering emotionally, prospering spiritually, prospering physically, or prospering financially. It says, I pray that you are prospering in every way and that you continually enjoy good health just as your soul is prospering. Let's take a look at the NIV of the same scripture. The NIV of the same scripture. It says, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. And so that tells me, especially if you are really looking at the Passion Translation, that tells me that prosperity is of the soul. Prosperity starts from the soul. God's desire is that we prosper even as our souls prosper. So if your soul is not prospering, it means that your pocket will not prosper. There's no two ways about it. There's no magic to it. It says, I pray that you are prospering in every way. And the only way that you can prosper in every way is clear. It says that you will continue to enjoy, to enjoy good health, but just as your soul is prospering. So prosperity starts from the soul. Tell your neighbor, prosperity starts from the soul. I can't hear you. Prosperity starts from the soul. So what is your soul? Because I know that we throw those words around a lot. And it's important that we can define that. So your soul is the part of you that houses your will, that houses your emotions, houses your memories, and that's where your decisions are taken. So your soul is, is a, a, a major part of you. Remember that you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in what? A body. You live in a body. So there are three parts of you. So you can take care of the physical, that's your body. You can also take care of your spirit, which is the part of you that is born again and is renewed. But you need to also take care of your soul. That's where your mind is. That's where your will is. That's where your emotions are. That's where your memories come from. That's where your decisions are taken. So a prosperous soul 
is a rich soul. So money comes from your soul being prosperous. It starts from there. So the reason why I started from this place and I brought your attention, the importance of you taking care of your soul and prospering in your soul, is that it plays a major role in your wealth. A lot of people don't know how their decisions affect them. And if your soul is not healthy, you can't make healthy decisions. So if you don't make healthy decisions, you are definitely not going to make money. It's as simple as that. There's no two ways about it. There's no magic about it. If your memories are bad, for instance, if you grew up in a household where money was very tight for you people, money was tight, maybe your father made a lot of bad decisions about money, or maybe your dad was just one of those people that just believed, spend everything, let's just spend all the money we have, why are we saving, why are we disciplined? Those are some of the things that you will, you will remember, and you will, be, you will be triggered when things like that happen around you. So when I see a lot of people who, for instance, um, grew up in a household where rent was normal, research has shown us that people who, are, who grew up in a house where rent was normal will end up being renters. People who are likely to own homes, their own homes, are people who their parents owned homes. So whether you like it or not, your background, your memories, things you've encountered growing up, your first encounter with money, your first relationship with money has a way of affecting your future with money. So all these things affect you, your soul. And so that's one of the reasons why the Bible says that you guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it flows the issues of life. If your heart, your soul is not in the right place, is not healthy, then you can't make money. One of the things I've found out is that poverty is not just bad because you can't afford to buy things. Poverty is bad because of what it does to your soul. So people are not, are not prosperous in their soul. And if you're not prosperous in your soul, it can't enter into your hand. So it's important that you begin to deal with how your mind and your soul sees money. Another thing you need to deal with is your emotions. For instance, if you fear not having money, you will not have money. Let's look at Job. Job himself said something. He said, the thing I feared the most... Can you give me that scripture? It said, the thing I feared the most came upon me. But I love the um, New American Standard Bible. The way it says it. King James says, the thing I feared the most came upon me. He said, for what I fear comes upon me. And what I dread befalls me. So if you're one of those people that you are constantly afraid you will not have money, chances are you will not have money. You know why? Because fear has torment. So you have to learn to manage your emotions. Fear itself has torment, and fear of poverty can cripple you. It can make you do things that will even make you, you make decisions that will make you end up being poor at the end of the day. So there are some things that you must know. First of all, you must address all those negative emotions that have kept you where you are today, that has made you make the kind of decisions that have kept you where you are today. So you have to first of all deal with it in your mind, deal with it with prayer, deal with it with the word. The Bible tells us that God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. Let's look, for, let's look at that scripture in Amplified. It says, God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of love. It's in 1 Timothy. Love, power, and a sound mind. I love the way the Amplified talks about how your mind is there. It doesn't just say a sound mind as some of the other scriptures generalize talks about having a well-balanced mind. When you have a well-balanced mind, it's easy for you to, to manage your emotions, to deal with triggers that come from your memories, to, to make sure that your will is in the right direction, and to make the right decisions. So it's important for you to understand that as a believer especially, one of the things that God expects you to have is the ability to control your emotions. Now, when it comes to money, one of the things that I think you must have if you are going to have money is discipline. To be honest, I don't know if there's any way to avoid this discipline issue. When I first got married, um, I, when I met Pastor Kay, in fact, I wrote about it in the book, I remember that, let me see if I can read a bit of it. So when I first got married to him, he wasn't earning a salary, so we're living by faith. 
And at first, I didn't understand what that meant until he started to explain to me that we're just going to have to trust God, you know, to pay our bills. And before that, I grew up in a home where if I had a need, all I had to do was to write a list. Yes, look at that scripture, 2 Timothy, sorry, 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but he has given us a spirit of power, of love, and of sound judgment and personal discipline, abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. If you don't have a calm, well-balanced mind, if you don't have self-control, these are the things that will keep you from having money. Self-control is what I'm talking about when it comes to discipline. You must be disciplined. There's no two ways about it. So when I met him, you know, he said to me, oh, I live by faith. And that was a very new concept to me because I live by faith meant I believe God. I go to my dad. My dad gives me money. That was, that was my own living by faith. So all of this was new to me. That's why I have a need. I don't have any way to get the money. And you know, at that time, we're not expecting a monthly salary from anywhere. Because I find a lot of people say, oh, they are, they are living by faith and then you are waiting on. We, we didn't have, when I say we didn't have any, we didn't have any means, any way. So there was no other way for us than to live a disciplined life. It was not even, it was not even an option. There was no way for us not to live a disciplined life because if you, if you try to live beyond your means, you will suffer hunger. So at that time, let me, like I said, let me see if, if I can read a bit of it to you. So I learned to trust God for my daily needs and to stop worrying about the future. I didn't know that it would be so liberating, but it was. I actually felt free because the things that were a burden were not even as important as I thought. So things like changing my phone every year was a luxury. It was not a necessity. If you're going to live a discipline, like one of the things you need to do is to know what's important and what's not. Every year, iPhone brings out a new phone. It's not for you. You have iPhone 12, 13, 14, 15. What are you using it for? You are making them rich. And you borrowed to buy it just because of status and things that are unimportant. So I had to now ask myself, what is, what is the thing that is important? You see, Proverbs 20, 23 verse 2 says, put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. Put a knife to your throat. What does that mean? Good news translation says, if you have a big appetite, restrain yourself. In other words, discipline yourself. Discipline yourself. It's not every new hair that comes out that you must buy. Not every new shirt that comes out that you must buy. Not every new phone that you must buy. You know, sometimes I laugh. I laugh because they will bring out the phone. Nothing is different about the phone. Except that now they've made three cameras. Next time, they will reduce the camera back to two again. And we are buying every year. Discipline. Learning to put a knife to your throat will save you. Learning to say no. It's not everything they bring to you that you can buy. So for me, I learned that changing my phone every year was a luxury. It was not a necessity. Having designer bags was no longer essential. What was important was that the bag was good and sturdy enough to carry the things that I needed. So I was learning to curtail whatever expensive taste that we had. We had to make the sacrifices necessary to move to our next level by living within what we were earning for the time being. It's for a time I knew that it was just for a season, but the sacrifice and discipline were necessary. I was also learning to live fully surrendered to God, knowing that he would keep his promises to me. I had to choose who I was going to trust, whether I was going to trust God or I was going to trust money. So I had to learn to live a disciplined life. I had to learn to just say, you know what? We cannot spend everything that we earn. Cannot spend everything that we earn. I honestly don't know how people do that. We cannot spend everything that we earn. We must learn to put certain things aside. So if you're going to make it, you must have a saving. Whatever you earn, I don't care how small it is, there must be something that you put aside. The other day I was reading, honestly, right now I can't remember the scripture, but I, I, I remember I was reading um, 
one of the letters that Apostle Paul wrote. And I was, you know how you are flipping through your phone and you just stumble on something. And I'm sure maybe projector will help me find it. And he was saying to them that put aside something every week. Save something every week in order to give. So that when I come, we will not need to be running around. You will give what you have. He says, put aside something every week. Put aside a little saving every week. And he said, he said, every first day of the week. So that means that when you collect whatever it is, put aside something. You know, he was asking them to save to give, right? I'm saying save to live, save for your future. So the first thing you need to know is that you must have an emergency fund. Thank you. First Corinthians 16 verse 2. I was just recently, I just stumbled on it. It says, on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up. The version already said, and save it as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. So put aside something every week. Save it. Every first day of the week, save something. So once you collect your money, save something. You can't eat everything. And it takes a lot of discipline to be able to do that. A lot of discipline. It takes a lot of discipline to be in a car, eat at home, and then be in a car and get where you're going. Some people are fascinating to me. You eat at home. As you are in the car, you are going to work. They'll bring plantain chips, you buy. They bring gala, you buy. They bring cheese ball, cheese ball, ma. Cheese ball. How old are you? Cheese ball, you buy. They will pass with Pringles, you buy. You get to the office, they'll say they are doing sales. Does it concern you? Something you do not want to buy before. How is, how is that sales? <laughs> no, how is that sales? They'll say, oh, you don't understand. I'm saving 40%. 40% of what I don't need is still waste. I'm, saving, I'm not saving 40%. I'm spending 60%. So it takes a lot of discipline. So you must have an emergency fund. Save for you. You never can tell. Something can just happen. So as you're going, if you break somebody's egg on the road, what will you do? So it takes discipline. You must save an emergency fund. You must save for an investment. So I'm not just saying save to keep your money because, of course, we all know inflation and everything. But save, save so that tomorrow you can invest and that money can work for you. Right now you are working for money, but there must come a time in your life where your money begins to work for you. And the only way you can achieve that is if you can be disciplined enough to save what you need to invest. So I'll give you a very short story and a, more, a testimony. I mean, we share it everywhere, so I don't know. I, I mean, I can share it here as well. So when Pastor Ken and I first got married, he was... Uh, his personality is a, he's a spender, right? And I'm a saver. He says it all the time. But his money personality is that he's a spender. I talked about money personality in my book, so if you don't know what money personality is, you need to find out. So Pastor K is a spender. He spends big. Pastor K believes that. You see this life. This life is for enjoyment. Make me groove. Because you don't know what will happen tomorrow. When I say, oh, let's just say, no, no, Jesus can't come tomorrow. Not when, so what will happen to the money? <laughs> So he had this behavior and this attitude of always wanting to just enjoy life, just spend any money that comes. With us. And I, I've always had this, you can't eat everything you earn, so save some. So when Pasuke turned 40, I realized that this man didn't even have one million to his name, to be honest. He was so reckless. Like he would have money, would just be doing something. Pasuke, once he would just arrive, he has ordered one thing. <laughs> He has all that one car, and he spends big. He's not, he's not this uh, let's just buy the uh, gala. Let's buy. No, what's okay is a let's buy the big one that when you feel it, you to your, your chest will feel it as your account is feeling the, <laughs> the debit. And so when it got to that stage, I was a bit concerned. I was very concerned, not a bit, very concerned because by this time we'd, we'd had um, our kids. So David, yes, David was about a year old or so. So I remember really, you know, concerned about it, and I went to God with it, and I said, God, the way this man is living, you know, the only time he's disciplined is when we want to sow a seed. Well, he's not disciplined enough to save money. And then God said something to me. He said, you will be disciplined enough to save for him. So I started taking money aside and keeping it. I started saving money aside and keeping it. And without his, without his knowledge, I'll just save the money. I'll just take the money, save it and keep it. I'll take the money, save it and keep it. And I was doing that for a while. Then one day, 
I don't know why he asked for statements because no, my basket doesn't care about the account. He's not, that's what I'm saying. He lives free. He's, he doesn't even know how much we have, so he would just spend. You just say, I'm, I want to buy this. I want to buy this estate. Uh, <laughs> how much are they saying? How much do you have? So, one day he asked for the account. Said, I don't know what he was looking for. So, the accountant now said to him, um, this is there. So, she sent it to him. He now said, I was taking money every week. Because that's what I was doing. I was taking money every week. Anytime he takes money, I would take. But I was taking it to save it for him. So if he takes 100K, I would take 100K. If he takes 50K, I would take 50K. So that's what I was doing. Anytime he takes money out, I would take and save. So the lady, he now said to the lady, why is Pastor M taking money? She now said, I think you need to ask Pastor M. So he called me and said, ah, honey, I know that I'm taking money. What are you using it for? I said, I'm spending it now. He laughed. He said, you don't spend money. Who are you giving this money to? I said, I'm not giving anybody money. He said, eh. So when he pressed me, pressed me, pressed me. Everybody knows Pastor K is my mumu button. So he pressed me. I finally told him. I said I was saving the money for you. So he, he laughed. He found it very amusing. I was like, how much have you saved? You see, one of the things we don't know is that if you check the money you are spending, because you are spending it 1-1K, 10K, 20K, 50K, you don't know how many millions that adds up to when you put it together. All the, I must drink up with every meal. Put it together, you'll be amazed how much you spend in a month. So he first laughed and said, how much do you spend? When I told him the amount I had saved, hey, let's go put his mouth. He said, yeah, let's do it well. That's how I got him on board. And today, that money that we're saving now is the money that we've been able to invest to begin to plan for our future. So it may look like a small thing, but if you can save those little, little, little things, you'll be amazed at how far it will take you. The second thing you must have besides discipline, or at least it's even a part of discipline, because remember, we're talking about the disciplined soul. Your soul must be disciplined if you're going to make money. Second thing is contentment. Contentment. Ah, you must be content if you're going to make money. It's not everything that passes. Not everything that passes that you must have. You must be satisfied. You must be content. It's okay to wear the same shoe. It's okay to carry the same bag. It's okay. Your friends are buying gold. You can't afford it. It's okay to admire it on them. It's one of the blessings of the soul that I have. I have a very content soul. You like, you can wear anything you want to wear. I'm happy for you. You can buy anything you want to buy. I'm happy for you. I'm not moved. I'm not jealous. I'm satisfied. Very satisfied with what I have. I'm happy with it. We must get to that point where we are so content in who we are, what we have, and how the Lord has blessed us. And that will mean that you must avoid comparison. One of the things that comparison does is that comparison is the thief of joy. You will be okay with your cloth or the way it is until you see your friend with, with bag that matches their cloth. Then all of a sudden you realize that, oh, mine doesn't look so good. Why? Because you are comparing. You see, one of the things that you must do if you are going to make money in this life is to mind your business and work with your own hands. When I found that scripture, it changed my life. And I found that scripture early. Which is one of the things that really helped me. I don't care who's spending money. I don't care whether they are buying a shrebi. If I don't have, what I have is what I wear. You're not really going to kill me. You're not going to kill me. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 to 12 together. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 to 12. Because these are some of the things that we don't know. This, I mean... We can, we can sit here and teach you financial principles. But it's the simple everyday things. That's what makes the difference. Oh, those simple everyday things. Look at the instruction that Apostle Paul gave. He said, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. That means all this I'm going to every party. Lead a quiet life. What are you looking for? What's in this outside? Make it your ambition to live a quiet life. You know, I found out that it is the, the people that don't even have real money that are noisy. Yes. Empty barrels make the loudest noise. The people that don't have money are the ones that are the noisiest. They wear loud clothes. 
They met, when they enter a room, do you know who I am? You are nobody. That's why we don't know. For you to ask me, do you know who you are? Then you are nobody. He says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Then look at the next verse. If you get this, it will save you forever. Ne- not the next verse. Give me the next line. Go back to the scripture I was reading now. You should mind your own business. Tell your neighbor, mind your own business. This your neighbor is not listening. Tell the other neighbor, say, mind your own business and work with your hands. He said, mind your business and work with your hands. Stop looking at what your neighbor is driving. Stop looking at what school their children are in. They can afford it, you can't. I have seen one of the things that is the most fascinating to me is doing counseling. You will see two people that are managing themselves. <laughs> their salary is not even, we are still helping them to figure out their finances. Then they will start calling me big wedding. We want to do this. We want to get the dress from this place. We want to, and you, if you ask them very well, you will see that it's because that's what other people are doing. You borrow money to be on blogs that you got married. Who cares? Somebody will get married tomorrow again. They will, and, and they put another person on the blog. He says, mind your own business. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. Now, person will go another person and ask, now you know, say, mama cut in tear. Mind your own business. Stay in your house, mind your business, stay in your lane, and work with your own hands. That's Bible. It says, work with your own hands. Get busy doing something. Not looking at what your neighbor is doing, not looking at what they are wearing. Ah, look at the shoe they wore. Ah, this is my own shoe. <laughs> it's the shoe you have wear it. That's what discipline is. And remember, it's for a season. There are always times and seasons for a season. They say, mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you. Give me verse 12. Verse 12 says, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, so that you will not be dependent on anybody. What comparison does is, you will see that this person is doing seemingly better than you. You will go and borrow. You see all those social media influencers. Half the time, they are wearing clothes, they return. You are stressing yourself for nothing. Some of you earn more than those influencers. They are living big. The reason why it's disturbing you is because you don't mind your business. The reason why it's bothering you is that you don't mind your business. They will rent private jets, sit inside, take picture, and come down and say, Oh, I flew fly, but they did not fly any silly private jet, any nonsense. You'll not be feeling sorry for yourself. Hey, see my life, see my mates. And I went to school with Tao. I know when she started this her skits. I know when she started this her business. I know when she started selling hair. And we went to school together. Mind your business. Minding your business is part of discipline. Mind your business and work with your own hands so that you won't end up being dependent on anybody else. Another angle to discipline we're going to look at now is Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. Tell your neighbor you must have a disciplined soul. It must be a well-balanced soul. One that you are able to control. Amen. Proverbs 21 verse 17. New Living Translation. It says, those who love pleasure become poor. Those who love wine and luxury will never be rich. There's a time for everything. Those who love pleasure become poor. That entitlement life, that enjoyment life, you have not reached to enjoy. You think it is time to enjoy. He says those who love pleasure become poor. Those who love wine and luxury will never be rich. That entitlement lifestyle, give me verse 20. He says the wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. No discipline. Anything that enters your hand, you just enjoy because you enjoy life. Let's just enjoy life. After all, waiting, we do it in the apple. Waiting, we come this life for. He says, You will never be rich. Never be rich. Give me NIV. It says, You will never be rich. NIV of, um, of 17. See it. Whoever loves pleasure will become poor. 
Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich. Never be rich. Give me an LT verse 20. Let me see that in verse, that verse 20 again. It says, the wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. So someone who spends everything they have, the Bible describes them as fools. It's wisdom that brings wealth and luxury. And wisdom dictates that sometimes you put a knife to your throat. It's not everything. I'm telling you, mind your own business and work with your own hands. If you stop putting pressure on yourself by looking at the things that are on social media, the things that people are doing, your life will change forever. Now, another level to discipline is patience. There are times and there are seasons. Ecclesiastes 1 says that there's a time, 3 1 says there's a time for everything. There's a time to save, there's a time to spend, there's a time for enjoyment, but there's a time to pay the price. There's a time for enjoyment, but there's a time to pay the price. I remember when Pastor K and I were trying to come out of certain realms, and the Spirit of God had told us that the same measure with which you measure, it will be measured back to you. So in other words, you determine your harvest. When we saw that scripture, we now said, ah, that means that if we give in millions, we will receive in millions. And I remember the sacrifice it took for us to gather the money together to sow it. When we now wanted to enter into the realm of earning in dollars, I remember that every dollar that came, Pastor gave me sure we sowed it. He would tell me they don't eat this type. Ah, at some point I started thinking, whether well, this man, this man, is he allergic to enjoyment? They will bring money, you say, we don't eat this kind. They will bring money, we don't eat this kind. Which one do you now eat? $10,000, you don't eat. $200, you don't eat. What, which one do you now eat? 100000 you don't eat. But I'm very grateful that he understood our season. And we must pray that we will be like the sons of Issachar. We understand seasons and times. And we know what we ought to do in that season. There's a season for saving. There's a season for making sacrifices. It's not, it's not at this stage. At this stage when you don't even have money, like you're hustling to buy business cards. Let me tell you, if you're hustling to do anything, it's not your level. You're putting your children in expensive schools and you borrow to pay it. You borrow to pay house rent. The house is too big for it. It's not yet your size. Patience. You must be patient. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. There's a time. A time is coming when it will be easy for you. And when it's easy for you, you won't need to tell anybody. But now, if you are struggling, then it's not your time. You know what I've learned? I've learned that if you jump up, you will still come down. But if you grow up, you stay up. So there are sacrifices that must be made for you to grow up and stay up. But if you are doing now, all you are doing now is jumping. You borrow to jump. You jump. You jump and pay uh, house rent. You jump and pay school fees. You jump and pay business class. There's a time and a season. You must understand the time and the season and you must wait it out. You must understand that time. As, and I remember when we were sewing then. I remember one day, I wanted to go and buy egg. We didn't have an egg at home. I carried my key. I was going to drive up. I said, where are you going to? I said, I want to go and buy egg. He said, egg. And I remember it was a season where we were trying to put money together to, make, to sow a seed. He said, you want to go and buy egg? I said, eh. He said, anybody that wants to eat egg in this house relate. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you the kind of sacrifices we had to make at that time. There's a time for everything. Wait for your season. Don't run ahead of God. Don't run ahead of yourself. There's a season and a time. It will happen in due season. And when it happens that way, you will know that it was God. I want to share something with you. When, because at a point in your life, God will begin to bless you. And if you are not careful, you will think that, oh, that means that now that uh, God has blessed me, we can just be flexing, we can just be enjoying anyhow. There's a certain way to behave when the blessings of God come into your life. Now, there are two things that I know that really helped me and helped my discipline. Number one is the principle of the first. And I'm not just talking first fruit, all those things. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the principle of honoring God first. So for a long time, I had this habit of 
when I get money, I'll remove my tithe and I'll start spending. I will, so when I have the time, I'll pay my tithe. And one day, it just occurred to me, the Holy Spirit dropped it in my heart. He said, if God cannot be Lord of all, he doesn't want to be Lord at all. So what he wants from you is not the money, it's the honor attached to that money. He says, so you can't treat God as an afterthought. God must be first. You know what discipline it takes to give God his own money before you start doing anything. So when I want to do something, I say, hey, I'm not with my tithe. I can't shout, I can't shout. Please help me pay my, let me pay my, let me transfer. God first. God first. It takes a lot of discipline. Someone said to me one time, he had money to pay his tithe, but he needed to pay something else. And he said to me, yeah, God, God does not need the money now, so I'll do it later. I'll pay God. I said, no. Your Lord means that he's priority in your heart. The principle of the first is so important because it teaches you discipline. That you won't do anything else until you do God's own. And that's how Pastor K was when we're believing God for things like that. And you will see this running through the scripture. Elijah was hungry and he met this woman. It was a time of famine, woman, widow of Zarephath. And he went there and he asked her for food. And she said she had just a little oil and flour. She wanted to make food for her and her son that they would eat and die. He said to her, don't worry, don't be afraid. Make for me first. Then you have enough for you and your son. And that's what happened. She made for him first. Then she, her son, Elijah, had many to eat. They had enough to eat for many days. If you look at the New Testament, the same thing. Jesus sent Peter to go and pay their tax. Told him when you catch fish, you will see coin in his mouth. He said, pay for me first then you have enough to pay for yourself first. If he, if he can't be Lord of all, he doesn't want to be Lord at all. Now, the final thing is this. When Jesus had a huge breakthrough, what did he do? That's what you must ask yourself. What was Jesus' response when he had an overflow? Most times when we have overflow in our lives, maybe we have excess money. Ah, we want to go on a shopping spree. We want to do all those things. Jesus is your Lord which means that you pattern your life after his, right? So now we need to ask ourselves, how did Jesus handle a season of not having? How did Jesus handle a season when he had? What did he do? John chapter 6, I'll read you from verse 1 to 12, the New International Version. I dealt with this in the book of Fluence, so you need to get the book. It says, some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. And when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, It will take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be what? Let nothing be wasted. He says, so they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. So Jesus did a a fantastic miracle. And the miracle was that he multiplied bread and fish for 5,000 people to have enough. And when they had enough to eat, we've enjoyed now. We don't groove now. Let's be going home. Jesus said, don't even try it. He said, gather every leftover you can find. Let nothing go to waste. You know, it's like, you know what it's like? You just went for party. You did party in your house. Oh, I'm there. And then you see people have eaten anyhow because there's excess food, there's drink. And then they just stand up and go in. Jesus said, what are you doing? 
I'm, I'm not, I don't really understand what people are doing. Start packing every leftover. See that chicken they did not touch. See that? Gather everything, my friend. Let nothing waste. What that does is that it shows me that God hates waste. When God sends you plenty, being wasteful is not an option. And that's how we must be. You know, a lot of times, like I said before, a lot of times we don't know how much we're wasting. Gather everything that remains. Gather the leftovers. Do whatever you have to do to ensure that nothing is wasted. God hates waste. Do you know, I can't stop, I can't stop wondering, right? Every time I read this scripture, I've read it so many times. Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. I've read an other version say, gather the fragments that remain. Let nothing waste. I've read it in many translations. The point is still the same. Don't waste anything. And every time I think about this scripture, I consider maybe Jesus was trying to teach us that the things we are wasting daily, if we put them together, it will be enough for you for the whole year. Maybe you need to think about that. The little things that seem to waste, some of that your money that you are wasting daily, if you gather them together, you will have enough to sustain you all year round, every single day of the 12 months of the year. Because when they gathered everything that remained, it was 12 baskets full. And they had more than enough. So maybe the secret to your having more money is not in hustling more, is in being disciplined more. So for you to be more blessed, to be more prosperous, you must have a disciplined soul where you bless this morning, where you, bl- where you really, really bless this morning. Let's just go ahead and talk to God this morning and say, Father, I thank you. Thank you because I have a well-balanced mind, a mind that I can control. I have self-control. I can manage my emotions. It's not everything that I see that I want to eat. It's not everything. Not everything that comes my way that I want to buy. I have discipline. I have learned to put a knife to my truth. Makalabo shata. Ask for grace to be more disciplined. Mandele boko shata. You don't have a money problem. You have a discipline problem. And I ekelibra halokodo shata. I am disciplined. My soul is disciplined. Manda braka ludo shita liyakade. Rekabato kose neke liyamahande gede. Amaladi yamashata liyabrahande gede. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word today that has brought light. I thank you because you've pointed us in the direction where we've been struggling. Thank you because you've shown us that it is in the waste that we have every day. And from today, we make a commitment, Lord, to be more content, to mind our own business and work with our hands, to stop comparing ourselves with others, to be patient and trust the process and understand that there are times and there are seasons. Father, we thank you because we'll be able to manage our emotions. We have well-balanced minds, we have disciplined minds, and we have a soul that is disciplined. For in Jesus' name we've prayed. Go ahead and celebrate God. Hallelujah. Celebrate God. Celebrate God. Go ahead, celebrate God this morning.